Well, good evening. Uh, I'm Don Carlton. I'm the executive director of the Dolph Briscoe Center here at the uh, University of Texas. And welcome to another in the series of programs co-sponsored by the LBJ Library and the Briscoe Center. It's a very special pleasure for me to introduce our guest tonight, uh, Governor Bill Richardson. Governor Richardson has led a distinguished public service career as a member of Congress, as U.S. Amb Ambassador to the United Nations, as Secretary of Energy in Bill Clinton's second term in office, and as Governor of New Mexico from 2000 until 2008. At the end of his term as governor in 2008, Bill Richardson sought the Democratic nomination for president. He left the race after the primaries in Iowa and New Hampshire and announced his support for Barack Obama. And with the New Hampshire primary being held today, I'm sure that Governor Richardson will have something to say about his experience uh, in that primary. As a member of Congress from 1983 until February of 1997, Bill Richardson divided much of his time between representing his constituents in his congressional district in northern New Mexico and carrying out high stakes foreign rescue missions, including at President Clinton's uh, request, negotiating with Saddam Hussein in Baghdad and with the North Korean leadership uh, in 1996. At the press conference in 1997, when President Clinton announced that he was appointing Bill Richardson, our ambassador to the United Nations, the president pointed out, and I quote, just this week, Congressman Richardson was huddled in a rebel chieftain's hut in Sudan, eating barbecued goat and negotiating the freedom of three hostages, unquote. As a diplomat and special envoy, Richardson has received four Nobel Peace Prize nominations, and he has successfully won the release of hostages and American servicemen in North Korea, Cuba, Iraq, and the Sudan. Bill Richardson has authored three books, including his autobiography, Between Worlds, The Making of an American Life, and How to Sweet Talk a Shark. Strategies and Stories from a Master Negotiator, uh, which was published in 2013. I especially uh, like Bill's alternate title for that book, by the way, which is just in the inside jacket, and that is, quote, A Master Diplomat's Guide to Negotiating with People Who Want to Eat You, unquote. <laughs> Bill Richardson is now active on the national and international speech circuit, and he appears frequently on numerous television news programs, including those on CNN, Fox, MSNBC, and Univision. He's established two foundations, the, Rich the Richardson Center for Global Engagement, which focuses on conflict resolution and prisoner release, and in partnership with Robert Redford, the Foundation to Preserve New Mexico Wildlife, which seeks to protect wild horses and provide alternatives to horse slaughter. Few can match Bill Richardson's wide-ranging experience and dedication to protecting and improving human rights. And I'm pleased to note that Governor Richardson donated his papers to the Briscoe Center last March. That generous gift, which included his papers as an eight-term member of the House of Representatives, greatly enriched the Center's extensive collection documenting the history of the United States Congress. The Center's collection of congressional papers, by the way, is the largest archive of its kind outside of Washington, D.C. In addition to the gift of his papers, Bill Richardson has become an active supporter of the Briscoe Center as a member of the Center's Advisory Council and as a goodwill ambassador promoting our services and programs to our public. Governor Richardson will be interviewed on stage tonight by my good friend and colleague, Mark Updegrove, the renowned director of the LBJ Library, who certainly needs no formal introduction to this audience. So please welcome my good friends, Mark Updegrove and Governor Bill Richardson.
<laughs> well, welcome, Governor. Delighted to have you here. Thank you. Welcome to the LBJ Library. Uh, Don mentioned in his uh, introduction uh, this wonderful book, How to Sweet Talk a Shark, which uh, I've had the pleasure of reading. It's absolutely delightful. And it highlights one of the more interesting parts of your background, the fact that you have dealt with tyrants and despots throughout the world. And you write in it, uh, you have uh, negotiated with narcissistic despots and power-hungry tyrants who cared more about their own skins than they do about their own countries. So how did you become the go-to guy for going up against the bad guys throughout the world? You know, Mark, uh, President Clinton, one time he was asked, well, why do you send Richardson to talk to all these people? And President Clinton put it very succinctly. He said, bad people like him. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, 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 and when you do a, a domino effect, when one, the first one was uh, two American pilots in North Korea, and we got one of them out. I stayed there for two weeks. I think the North Koreans were so sick of me, they gave me the pilots because <laughs> they wanted me to leave. But that uh, brought a succession of other different missions under President Clinton. I, I did some under President Bush, and uh, one recently with an American Marine in Mexico, uh, President Obama. Well, I wasn't an envoy, but I was involved. But, you know, it, it, it's something that is part of your nature. When I was a congressman, I always tried to negotiate problems when I had town meetings. I, you know, New Mexico, Native Americans, Hispanics, uh, Anglos, conservatives, everybody's fighting over land or water or environmental issues. And at these meetings, I would try to resolve the problem right there. So that, that become became a part of my nature. Let, I, I know we'll go into, I, I want to just say how honored I am to be here at the LBJ Library. Lyndon Johnson was one of my heroes because he was a supreme negotiator. You should read either Mark's book or Becklock's book about how Johnson would, he had a different technique of negotiating. It was called in, <laughs> intimidation. <laughs> But, but he succeeded with, with the Civil Rights Act and the Great Society. And, you know, and I'm also on the board of the, uh, the Johnson, Lady Bird Johnson, Lucy uh, Environmental Awards. I don't know if I've been fired because I haven't made the last board meetings, but um, a great environmental legacy, too, uh, from Lady Bird. So I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be part of the Briscoe Center. Uh, you know, what a, what a great job Don Carlton has done. You have, you know, real, real politicians. Uh, you have newsmen. You got the great Willie Nelson's papers here. I'd like to see them. I don't know what, what they consist of. I, I don't want to know. Um, <laughs> but I also, just in conclusion, I want to, uh, besides the Johnson family and all the Johnson people, I want to recognize my buddy, uh, a great Texas politician. His name is Ben Barnes. He was, <laughs> did you know that Ben Barnes was Lieutenant Governor of Texas at age 12? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> he was about 28, the youngest ever. And you know, his, he still is so active and involved and I see him up front here. It's, it's great to see you, Ben. But, but to the Johnson legacy and to the library and to all of you, from, from Austin and the, the fact that you're here. I mean, I'm, I'm not used to drawing these crowds anymore, so I'm very happy. Well, again, we're thrilled to have you here. And I, it, while President Johnson is renowned for his skills at negotiating, so are you. I, I want to ask, what makes a great negotiator and what makes a great negotiation? What makes a great negotiator? You know, I, I'm asked this a lot. I think you just have to connect with the other person. The other thing that I like to say that doesn't go over very well, it's easier to negotiate with a dictator because all you have to do is convince that person. You don't have to go to legislatures <laughs> or press. Um, <laughs> you have to connect personally. You have to show respect. 
You know, I always, when I negotiated, and, and, and the North Koreans or the Cubans or the Sudanese said, you have to come here and meet with us on our turf. I always conceded that. I thought that that was a very easy concession to make. Um, I think you have to get into their culture. You have to, you know, when I negotiated with Castro and Latin, I speak Spanish. Um, in Africa, I speak a little French. You, you try to show that personal respect. I mean, I remember early on, the Department of State, you know, it's a great institution and all that, but they'd give me these talking points. Uh, when I'd go in and my objective was try to get some Red Cross workers from Sudan, and the person I was negotiating with was not a nice person. And the talking points would say, you know, basically, you're not a nice person. The U.S. condemns all your, well, I wasn't gonna use that. <laughs> but so, so you also have to find ways to let the other side save face. You got to know where you're going to end up. Um, you have to basically be honest and say, look, Saddam Hussein, you release these two Americans, you're not going to get better relations with the U.S. You know, that relationship is not good. You're going to get one day of good press. I will say something nice about you. I remember Saddam Hussein said, well, would President Clinton say something nice? I said, no, he won't. He already told me he's not. Um, <laughs> And so you connect, and, and maybe at that point, the dictator has felt he's maximized his ability to squeeze the issue, the ceasefire, and it's time to, to make the release. And then you say, you know, uh, we will find a way maybe to improve the relationship. But honesty, candor, let the other side save face, let the other side make the announcement know that you're going to internally be uh, spun around press-wise in their country, and, and then move on. But another is, once you succeed, Mark, in getting the other side to agree, get out, because they'll <laughs> change their mind. Leave town. This happened to me with, with Saddam Hussein. Right. Um, I had the two Americans out, and then he said to me, uh, you know, I know you're a Catholic. And, and you've asked to go to a Catholic service. And uh, Tariq Aziz, the foreign minister, uh, his wife is a Chaldean Catholic. She'll take you to a service tonight. And, you know, I remembered how Saddam Hussein would change his mind. And I said, no, no, Mr. President, I got to leave now. I have a vote in the Congress. It was not true. There were no votes scheduled. It was a recess. And uh, that was supposed to be funny, I guess it was. <laughs> um, so I went, you know, uh, so we were talking and, and I was trying to get out and I said to Saddam Hussein, I said, you know, Mr. President, I really have to leave. No, no, you said you wanted to go, now you go. Plus, he said, uh, I do recommend if you want to get back to the United States, don't go to confession. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, if you go to confession, you're going to be there a long time. <laughs> And then he smiled, and he smiled, he smiled, and it was the first personal connection that I think we'd made, and I knew for sure that I'd get the hostages out. Yeah. But right after the service, we left. <laughs> but you wrote of him, there was an aura around Saddam Hussein, but a dark one. Of all the dictators and despots with whom I've negotiated, by far, Saddam carried with him the most intensity. I said of Saddam shortly after our meeting, his eyes are like the eyes of death. So what's it like to be staring into those eyes? Well, I was scared. <laughs> my, I remember looking at my hands and I was sweating when we were sitting like this. And around us uh, were all the revolutionary guards uh, under a curtain. You could only see you know, their boots. He was a very tall guy, imposing physically. He had his, his weapons, he had his knives, and, but he had those beady little eyes and he would just look at me without any expression. And I was going through the protocol, thank you for receiving me, Mr. President, my objective here. And then I made a terrible mistake, a cultural mistake. I crossed my legs and showed him the sole of my shoe, which was dirty which in an Arab country is an insult. I'm very insulted right now. 
And I had from the State Department, do not cross your legs in front of Saddam Hussein or any Arab leader. It's, I was so tired. We had been driven all night. And what these dictators like to do is they like to get you when you're tired, you're vulnerable, you're hungry. Fidel Castro, I remember about 2 a.m., his people would knock on your hotel door. President is ready to see you. And I say, okay, what time? This morning? No, right now. Um, the same thing with Saddam Hussein. We went in, it was in the evening. And all of a sudden, after I did that, he looked at me and got up and walked out. And Tariq Aziz was right here, the foreign minister. And he said, you've insulted the president. It's, it's, uh, it's a terrible cultural mistake that you've made. And I had. I, I shouldn't have done that. And I said, well, what do I do? He said, well, you should apologize. And I said, well, is he coming back? Uh, and Tariq Aziz says, he'll come back, but you must apologize. So Saddam Hussein came back. You know, he's still angry, still with that expression. And I took a gamble. I said, you know, maybe, maybe I played into this and, and they know that they have me. And I'm not going to apologize. I'm going to be polite. I'm going to repeat my message. And I remember when he sat back and I didn't apologize, uh, Saddam Hussein looked at me and, and that little creaky smile, he might have thought this this guy is nuts, or maybe there's something there that I like, I don't know. But I didn't apologize, and then we went on and on, we'd go back and forth, and then all of a sudden, he stops looking at me, and he says, you know, by virtue of the authority vested in me in Article 21 of the Iraqi Constitution, I hereby turn over the two Americans to you. He wouldn't look at me, but what I did, Marcus, I said, hey, thanks. You should have seen the Revolutionary Guard. I thought they, were, <laughs> they thought I was going to do something. But then we stood up, and, and there was press coming in. And he said to me, you know, uh, we're taking this photograph. I'm going to release these two to you. This picture to my people does not help me politically. He said that to me. And I said to him, well, Mr. President, this picture doesn't help me either in the United <laughs> States. But there was a little bit of a connection. My point is, I know there's diplomacy, there's social media, there's press, there's so many scholars here that know how to negotiate. My view is you have to connect personally you have to show respect. You have to know where you want to end up, and you have to be lucky. Yeah. You started your re reputation for being able to negotiate with the bad guys, with the North Koreans. Uh, you dealt with uh, uh, the, 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 the founder of North Korea. You dealt with his son. Um, we, what, what are we to make of the North Koreans? What, what, is, what do they want? What is their MO? They operate totally differently than we do. In other words, their culture is not just a foreign culture. It's a unique culture. It's a cult of personality. Uh, the leadership, the Kim, Kim Il-sung, Kim his son, and now Kim Jong-un, who nobody knows much about. Right except that he's internally challenged and he seems to want to do these horrific executions and nuclear testing, uh, and nobody knows exactly why. Um, the cult of personality operates where the deity, the leader of the country, does no wrong. And everything emanates from that leader. And what happens is the North Koreans um, they don't believe in necessarily quid pro quos. I mean, when you negotiate, you say, okay, I'm going to do this. Can you do that? Um, you make this statement, I'll make this statement. I release this person. 
you do this. You stop nuclear testing. We made a deal with the North Koreans in the Clinton administration um, in exchange for food, economic assistance, lifting of sanctions. They would curb their nuclear weapons. They would end their nuclear weapons. Well, for nine years, that deal stood still. But then the North Koreans decided uh, they were going to abandon the deal. Mm -hmm. So signing protocols, uh, international agreements, UN resolutions, they, they don't see things that way. The danger now with North Korea is that we don't know exactly what motivates this young leader mm -hmm. who's about 35. He has very little political experience, no military experience, speaks a little English. He was educated in Switzerland. But he seems to be trying to generate support internally, which means that maybe he doesn't feel solidified in his power with the, with the military, with, uh, with the party bosses, with his own family. Uh, there are reports he's executed members of his own family right. who he feels challenging. But in the past, the North Koreans will apprehend an American, and then they will want something in return, like a visit that leads to some kind of negotiation or a prestige visit. Jimmy Carter's been there. Bill Clinton's been there. They turn over the prisoner. They feel they have uh, you know, international press out of it. But this time, they, they keep apprehending Americans Sometimes they release him. There's a young man now from Ohio. Governor Kasich of Ohio called me about him because I'd been involved in these negotiations and, and asked me to help. And, and you know, I'm trying to help with that one. But um, with this new leader, when he continues to detonate nuclear weapons, test hydrogen bombs, I don't think they have a hydrogen weapon, but then refuses dialogue, and the United States says, well, we're going to have more sanctions at the United Nations. Uh, we're going to impose banking sanctions. We're maybe going to have a cruise uh, missile defense with South Korea. Um, and, and he keeps shooting missiles. And, and, then, and then China, which has leverage over them, right. doesn't want to help us. I mean, they feel they want trouble there. And... So they're stalemate. My view is, I think we have to find a way to engage them. Maybe new actors, maybe the Pope, maybe a UN envoy, maybe some new kind of dialogue. Because we've got 30,000 American troops there. We have a, they have nuclear weapons, eight or nine. Um, it's a tripwire. I think we, with Iran, we moved in the right direction. We have an agreement. I think hopefully this will be one of the final hopefully legacy achievements of the, of the administration. But I see no sign quite yet. What are we to make of the rocket launch on Sunday, which seems to be a, a veiled attempt to get long-range missiles, and perhaps uh, nuclear missiles, right? Well, it, it, is, it does seem to be an excuse, the launch, for a ballistic missile. And, and the South Koreans I saw in the press are saying that possibly they have the technology, the North Koreans, to reach the United States, and the, the western part. Not exactly the mainland, but you know, maybe, maybe Alaska. I haven't seen the technical verification of this. But you know, it's disturbing because uh, the objective in the past of uh, this man's father and the grandfather is they do a test like that, then they say, okay, here's my price. Uh, we need food, we need wheat, we need uh, energy assistance, take off sanctions. And you start negotiating, you know, President Bush did this, Clinton did this, but now this man just detonates and, and nothing happens and there's no outreach. He refuses to talk to anybody. Uh, the only guy, I'm jealous of Dennis Rodman, he only <laughs> talks to Rodman. <laughs> Can we count on, you mentioned that Kim Jong-un is capricious and unpredictable. Can we count on China to contain North Korea if they do continue to rattle sabers? So far, China has failed to contain North Korea. And you have to ask yourself why. 
my view, and this is not shared by your China expert here and, and around the country, my view is that China wants this turmoil to happen in the region against us, against South Korea and Japan. China has geopolitical ambitions to be the dominant power in Asia. They've struck a new relationship with Russia. Both are members of the Security Council, so it's doubtful whether you can put really, really stronger sanctions because China and Russia could veto them. Now, China does not want North Korea to fall apart because then there would be thousands of refugees going into China. But keeping North Korea turbulent and letting them do what they're doing, I see that as China's interest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even though they're members of the six party talks and they, they condemn North Korea, they voted for the condemn resolution in the Security Council two days ago. China could have leverage. They give them food, they give them uh, all kinds of uh, trade, they give them uh, commercial relationships, they you know, give them computers, but they don't want to do anything, so there's a stalemate. Right. It's shifting gears to another threat, ISIS. Um, can the Islamic State be negotiated with? No, I, I don't think right now. I think their modus, their credo is, is a destruction of the West. Yeah. It, it's non-negotiable for them. Now, that doesn't mean that if there's a concentrated allied effort that weakens them, um, and that means not just a military bombing effort, but it means Turkey cooperating, which it has not, mm. with the humanitarian corridors, which it means a coalition of Arab countries. This is an Arab conflict providing the ground forces. I don't, there's no support in America or Europe for ground forces. Um, some kind of, there's also, I was very hopeful with President Obama and his dialogue with the Muslim world you know, unfortunately, there's been so much turbulence in the Middle East that, you know, it, it's hard to keep one crisis contained uh, with so many explosions. Right. But uh, I don't think you can negotiate, you can weaken them, and then I think through other actors, uh, curb their financing, uh, find ways to limit their capabilities, but this is gonna be a long effort. This is, uh, you know, this is Iraq uh, needs to get more active. Uh, the Turks need to get more active. I mean, we're doing 80% of the bombing. Germany, France are doing more. I mean, this is going to be a long range effort. Yeah. Governor, I'm not going to show you the bottom of my shoe, but I'm going to adjust your microphone because I think it's rubbing against your health. There we go. That's better. Great. Thank you. Uh, let me talk about another uh, dictator with whom you've dealt, and that's Fidel Castro, of whom you've written. He and I always got, in a got along. I'm no fan of his politics, nor the cruel iron fist he wielded to keep his population repressed and despairing. But I've generally felt ours was a good working relationship. Talk about that relationship and how it came to bear. This was a, a relationship that I started when I was a congressman, and I was able to get uh, three, uh, I think it was five political prisoners out of Cuba. And it was funny because we had a connection. It was baseball. I'm an old baseball player. He was a baseball player. Uh, we talked Spanish. Uh, he said, you should go watch a game. So I went to Cuba, to Havana, watched the game. I came back and we didn't start off too well because the score was something like 13-11. And I said, Mr. President, Cuban baseball, it's great. Great hitting, uh, you know, great drama, but your pitching's a little weak. And he looked at me as if I had insulted him. And he said, you're misinformed. I said, yeah, yes, you're right, I am misinformed because <laughs> I was trying to get these hostages out. But, you know, I dropped that one. But we, we started uh, talking uh, and, and getting into things. And, you know, Jesse Jackson, who, has also been quite successful in getting hostages out, had just been 
in, uh, in Havana and had gotten something like 25 out. And here I was trying to get four and Castro wouldn't do it. And I said, I'm gonna gamble. I'm gonna get a little politically incorrect here. I wasn't thinking that word because it wasn't in vogue then. But I said to Castro, I said, okay, so Jesse Jackson comes here. He gets 25 out and you're Hispanic. Brother, you're giving me nothing. <laughs> Castro looked at me and I thought it was another moment when I insulted him and he started laughing and he started laughing and he said, I'll give you five. <laughs> and I got five. But, you know, sometimes breaking the ice is important in a negotiation. I, you know, I wish I'd been a fly on the wall with Iran and these negotiations that we've had. Maybe, you know, there was some of that personal connection that our negotiators had with, with the Iranians. I don't know. But that usually succeeds because you're talking about human beings negotiating. Uh, you and uh, Fidel Castro weren't exactly roommates, but you did share a castle. Talk about that. Was that in the book? I forgot. It was what, in the book. The, the Hugo Chavez. The, oh the yeah, inauguration yeah. of Hugo Chavez. You were in a castle together, and it was it, it made for a very difficult oh yes, yes. diplomatic situation. Yeah, yeah. you all remember uh, President Chavez when he was elected. Um, I was sent to his inauguration. It was the last days of the Clinton administration, and Fidel Castro was at the event at the inauguration, there was like a cocktail party and it was in a big castle. And I had very specific instructions because when I went in, uh, in the Clinton administration, I had negotiated with all these dictators, Castro, and I had instructions. I remember Madeleine Albright, who was Secretary of State said, Bill, now that you're UN ambassador, you cannot meet with these bad people anymore. You're an official, you can't do that. Do you understand that? I said, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, and she was Secretary of State, and I was technically under as UN ambassador. So I went uh, to this castle, and, and I immediately had a number of State Department people there that I said to them, look, if Fidel starts walking towards me, because he knows me, you gotta do something. You gotta hit me and get me out of there. You gotta intercept us. And uh, what happened was, you know, two human beings knew each other. We came together. Uh, I, we shook hands. And I said, I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> but I didn't. And, it, and, and, you know, this diplomacy has these moments where, what do you do? You run away. Uh, at the time, I think that uh, Hugo Chavez uh, was, we didn't know what kind of president he was going to be, so I didn't want to disrupt the event. And, and everybody saw it. You know, I was the highest rank in America. I shook his hand. Yeah. I wasn't supposed to, but I did. Are you pleased that we have diplomatic relations established? Yeah, with, uh, yeah I think that makes a lot of sense. What does you that know? mean for us in the future? Well, for it, it basically, why is this in the U.S. interest? One, uh, this was a thorn in our side. All of the Latin American countries couldn't understand why we didn't have relations with Cuba. The embargo, you know, the embargo didn't work. Uh, actually, it was an excuse that Castro had to, to blame his economic woes on us. Uh, but it was bad with Latin American countries. Uh, I think if uh, there are a lot of Americans with educational, uh, with the cultural ties that were prevented from uh, getting closer. Um, lastly, uh, I do think that it makes sense. We're talking to China, we're talking to Iran. We weren't doing it with Cuba. Uh, so I think the president did the right thing. We have diplomatic relations. We don't have an ambassador. In fact, uh, Marco Rubio has prevented an ambassador from being confirmed to Mexico because this ambassador, uh, uh, Jacobson, her name is, was the chief negotiator for the detente with Cuba. So um, I think it's the right move. It's proceeding cautiously. What I'd like to do, what I'd like to see is Look, I think Castro, there's a report that Raul Castro is stepping down, I think it was this morning, uh, that the Cubans accelerate their release of political prisoners and move more towards democracy, maybe now with a new Cuban leader. But they've been quite slow, 
and we fulfilled our end of the bargain, but the, I think Cuba needs to move more towards uh, family visits through freeing political prisoners, allowing a little more democracy, having an election. I remember I said that to Fidel once. I said, you know, you, you, you don't have elections here. He said, no, I did, we do have elections. I got 92%. I said, well, who did you run against? Some dead guy? And he, uh, he, we already knew each other, so he tolerated that. You talked a moment ago, Governor, about the, uh, our agreement with Iran. Uh, in your view, is that a good deal or a bad deal? When it was signed, I, I didn't fully support it. I thought it was very strong on the nuclear reduction agreements. The Secretary of Energy, Ernie Moniz, had negotiated that. In other words, nor, uh, sanctions relief in exchange for uh, the enriched uranium of Iran being shipped to Russia, curbing it significantly uh, so that they don't make nuclear weapons. I thought that side was good. What I objected to, what I had some problems with was they hadn't released the American political prisoners, the Marine, the, new, the newsman, uh, there was a cleric. Uh, Iran still was aiding revolutions, uh, uh, dictatorships, uh, helping Assad, messing in Yemen, uh, terrorist organization financing them. And, and I wish we'd had more of that agreement. But I think what the administration has said is now the hostages were negotiated. That if you move Iran into the right frame of mind negotiating, being part of the Western international community, the moderates there will get stronger. We shall see. I still don't trust Iran. I still think we should have gotten a better deal, but uh, I think so far, with this release of the hostages, it's moving in the right direction. I think the big test is going to be, what will Iran do in these negotiations with Syria? Mm -hmm. They want to keep Assad there. I think Assad is, is, is a terrible leader. I think he needs to get out. Uh, but what should be the main objective? Fighting ISIS or getting rid of Assad? I believe the strategy is still to try to do both, but you know there have not been too many advances in either one. What is the greatest threat that we face internationally? Terrorism, ISIS, without mm -hmm. question. The second would be nuclear materials from countries like North Korea, them selling nuclear materials and rich uranium in the black market. Mm -hmm. You know, the third is probably North Korea itself, the tinderbox there. But I also think the other crises, uh, the humanitarian crisis, uh, the treatment of women, sexual abuse, right. environmental degradation, climate change, um, endemic diseases. Uh, this is something that I know the Johnson Center, the Briscoe Center, has some very good programs in that direction. I think that those humanitarian, I, I'm big on the wildlife issue. I think this is an emerging issue, protection of species, of elephants, of cougars, of, mount, of lions, of uh, elephants. Of, uh, my foundation recently signed an agreement with the Jane Goodall in, Institute mm -hmm. where we protect chimpanzees. I mean, chimpanzees, I don't know if people here know that they, 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 they have been tested uh, I think not maliciously, but for reasons, uh, medical reasons, so that we can find out more about certain diseases. Well, you know, I think this was cruel. My, one of my last uh, efforts as governor was to go to the NIH. It wasn't even my jurisdiction to stop this testing, and thankfully the NIH has done this. No more testing of chimpanzees. Let them live, let them be, you. let them be, I was gonna say human beings. <laughs> They probably would object to that. But, uh. <laughs> As we sit here, the New, York, the New Hampshire uh, primary is playing out. You were there eight years ago uh, when you were in the hunt for the presidential nomination yourself. You dropped out after New Hampshire. And then you incurred the ire of your former boss, Bill Clinton, by throwing your support not behind Hillary Clinton, but behind her chief rival, Barack Obama. What led to that decision? Well, I, I'll start up by saying about two months ago, Bill Clinton and I made up. <laughs> and I sought him out, because I didn't want both of us to go to our graves 
with this feud after us being very close. You know, Ben Barnes understands all this, you know, the personal side of politics. I think you all do. You, somebody you've had a long relationship, you want it to end well. Sure. Although I don't think Bill and I are ready to go, but um, my, my, so, so we've made up, I endorsed Hillary. I think she's, uh, she's a good candidate. I know she's having these problems, you know, uh, but at the same time, uh, I think she is supremely qualified. Now, um, you know, Iowa, New Hampshire, right, right now the New Hampshire primary is closed. And, you know, I didn't, I'm no expert. I didn't last very long in this presidential race. You know, it, it's funny, uh, we were talking on the other side. What do voters want in this election? Uh, when I was running in 2008, and so was Chris Dodd and Joe Biden and Hillary, we all thought, well, you know, if you're experienced, you've been a governor, you've been a, in public life, that's what gets you elected. That's what you should press. Well, the public didn't want to hear that. They wanted inspiration. They wanted Obama. You know, we were, we were like eliminated early, although with Joe Biden, every time, not every time I see him, I say, Joe, I wanna, want you to show me a little respect. I beat you in Iowa, you know. <laughs> I was fourth, he was fifth. And, and then we went on to South Carolina. We, we went on to uh, New Hampshire, and there were just four of us. I was still in the race. But I see Joe, and I say, you know, I beat you in Iowa and New Hampshire. He says, yeah, but I'm vice president, <laughs> which is true. <laughs> Worked out um, pretty well for us. <laughs> but so, so, you know, the, 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 I won't say the trouble with Iowa and New Hampshire. There are great experiments in democracy, great people, issue-oriented voters but they're not reflective of the American population. I mean, there may be two Hispanics in Iowa. No, I'm kidding. Uh, very few African Americans right. in both. So I think what happens is America, the more, ref the more distinctive American primaries happen when you start with South Carolina, you go to Nevada, Hispanics, African Americans in South Carolina. There are all kinds of voters, but there's more diversity. And that's where I think Hillary will be stronger. I think that she will lose tonight. She will lose to Bernie Sanders. And it could be a decisive victory. But uh, I think she still becomes a nominee. I will say to you that I've been totally wrong. I've been wrong about Trump. I've been wrong about Cruz. I've been wrong about Bernie Sanders. Because, you know, I'm just out of touch. I, I don't campaign or be out with the people the way I used to. I thought that Trump would flame out after you know a month, and the guy gets he seems to keep getting stronger. Cruz, I said, Gee, I, no offense, I know he's your senator, but <laughs> but I said, Jesus, why, you know well, this guy, th he's not going to get anywhere. I mean, the guy won Iowa, and then Sanders. Uh, so so there's right now. I think this election, you're seeing the difference in my. Race in 08, people wanted inspiration. They wanted drama. They wanted an Obama. This time, I think what they want is, uh, I saw a poll today, uh, New Hampshire voters. What's the most important thing to you? Uh, is it electability? It's like 8%. Nobody cares who, who's president. Number two, uh, thinks like me, shares my values. That's, that was like about 70%. And then the last one uh, that, that I noticed was um, tells it like it is. That was up there too. Mm. So this is the electorate. I'm it's just New Hampshire, but, but I think it's, it's out there. You know, mm -hmm. there's an anger out there. I think the big issue is income inequality. And, and whatever party touches that uh, is going to elect the next president. And so that's why you see the anger rising as it has because of the disparity and I think and there's income. an anger uh, at at the there's an anger at income inequality at wages uh, you know the lack of ep economic opportunity for young people um, even though the economy the indicators are okay uh, there's there's an unease that the establishment you know the Congress doesn't work with each other. The administration and the Congress fight over everything. You know, the, the proliferation of social media, which I think is good, 
but it's divisive. Uh, you know, you've got the, the cable networks, the, the super PACs. All of that has turned people off mm. on both sides. And, and it's something that, that you, you can't predict what is going to happen. You can't poll. I mean, polls have been so wrong. Mm -hmm. But I think that Sanders wins. And, you know, the, what, ha what happens with the Democratic Party is every four elections... Everybody says, okay, we gotta move to the center. Like Clinton, the Democratic Leadership Council. We gotta, you know, be more moderate. Well, you know, this time the message within the Democratic Party is progressivism is pretty strong. Mm -hmm. So does that mean you move to the left automatically? No, but it does mean you address some of these income issues that are out there. Uh, you know, these young, like with, with Hillary Clinton, I, I, I I now get all my news through Facebook because it, you know, everything happened. I love Facebook, especially people that, that put in, well, you know, today I, I'm depressed, so I'm gonna go have a cheeseburger. You know, it's just, it's entertaining. Uh, but, 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 you know, what I see is, for instance, on the women's issue, Hillary Clinton, I think her great strength is, is being the first potentially woman president. So she gets Secretary Madeleine Albright and Gloria Steinem basically going out there and saying, you know, you women should vote for women. I mean, God, this is terrible that you're not doing that. That didn't go over too well. Mm -hmm. Especially with a younger generation that, that is issue-oriented, that is not voting by gender, that is, so there's something out there that uh, is gonna fuel this election. But it, it, uh that's, it's, it's amazing to me that the prospect of the first women president is not capturing the imagination no. of young folks. Is that because we've advanced as a society to the degree where that's not as important as it might have been eight years, 16 yeah, years ago? it's not as important as it used to be. People want equality in, in, on their own terms. Mm -hmm. um, and it's defined and, and it comes, it's very evident in the social media that I see. You know, I'm, I'm old school. I love to read the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Albuquerque Journal, not all the time. But, um, you know, I like to touch them. You know, yeah. but now people get their news differently. And, and, and somehow what, what is emerging has, has escaped me especially Trump. I mean, I said, here's the guy that it's insulting veterans, and John McCain, insulting immigrants, Muslims, uh, women, and, and the guy seems to, you know, stay even, and he may win New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. I don't know what will happen beyond that. I think there will be an establishment candidate that emerges. Uh, you know, John Kasich and I served in the House. He was the budget committee chairman. He's a very moderate guy. I don't want to endorse him because it's going to hurt him. Uh, but, but, you know, he, he may emerge today. Uh, you know, I always thought that the biggest problems for Hillary Clinton in general were Jeb Bush and Kasich, mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily polling well nationally, mm -hmm. although Kasich may do well in New Hampshire, and Bush may do well in, in, in New Hampshire. We don't know. I don't know if there are any results yet. Yeah. We come back to the the election in a moment, but let me go back to your support of Barack Obama in 2008. Uh, did, did, did Barack Obama end up being the president you hoped he would be? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I look at the totality. Um, I, I like what he's done on, on social issues, uh, on foreign policy. Um, you know, I had some differences on, I would have been tougher on Syria, on Assad. Mm -hmm. On ISIS, I think more could be done. I like what he did with Cuba. I like what he did with bin Laden. Uh, I like what he's done with climate change. I think that's, that's terrific. Uh, domestically, you know, a lot of it was defensive. Uh, I think he helped a lot to rescue our economy that was going in the tank. Right. Um, I think Obamacare on the whole is good. Uh, so, but, but, you know, I was among one of those that said there's something special about this. why I endorsed them. I remember talking to my wife, my family. I said, 
you know, I, I know I've been with the Clintons. All, there's something special good about this guy, Obama. Uh, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> but, but it's good out there. I like how he's inspiring. I still think in the long run, his legacy will be a good one. Mm -hmm. Am I disappointed with some things he didn't do? Yeah, like everybody else. But uh, I am totally alarmed at the negativity, the, the polarization uh, on, on the other side towards just resolving our problems. Right. One of the criticisms uh, waged at him is that he doesn't stand for anything internationally. The United States doesn't have a defined position. Uh, is that a legitimate criticism? You know, um, in the conversation I had with Hillary Clinton um, when I endorsed her, I said, you know, you were a good Secretary of State. I think you've got to be clear about what you did. Without, like, every single treaty or achievement, I think you restored America's role in the world. We were, you know, in the Bush years, we were not team players. We were not liked. We were isolated. We did the Iraq War, which I think was a, a mistake. We were not a Lyndon Johnson international coalition country. And, and Hillary restored that. She also, I think, was the architect of the sanctions on Iran, which have brought Iran to the negotiating table. Those sanctions worked. Mm. So don't get into, you know, you did this treaty with Morocco or Mexico. Just focus on broader issues. Yeah, um, yeah on ISIS, uh, on Syria, um, uh, moving towards Obama. You know, I'm somebody that cares deeply about Latin America. I think we should pay more attention to Latin America, our neighbors in Mexico, Caribbean, you know, what's happening in Central America. I, I'm big on Africa. You know, nobody cares right now, but there's something like seven armed conflicts in Africa. And there's disease, there's malnutrition, there's sexual abuse, there's, and, and nobody like focuses on, on Africa. Right. Uh, I remember uh, Lyndon Johnson and Hubert Humphrey were the first that really focused on Africa and their, I mean, the, the, the Peace Corps did with, with Kennedy and, and, and AID, but, but they talked big about Africa. Right. I, think, I think you wrote about that too. But, you know, today uh, I, I'm, I'm disturbed about where our politics are heading. But I'm not a pessimist. I think eventually, when I travel around the world, people care about what we think. They say, okay, you screwed up here. You did some terrible things there, America. But, but in the end, we want you to lead. You lead. Even the Chinese say that to us mm -hmm. at these conferences on energy. So I think we still have that moral authority, but I wish we would exercise it more. Yeah. Looking back at the, 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 the election, the, the presidential race that's playing out. Uh, as a prominent Democrat governor, is Bernie Sanders an acceptable alternative to Hillary Clinton as a candidate? I think the fact that he's called himself a socialist is, is poison in a general election. I mean, I, I'm being honest. I think he deserves credit for raising issues, uh, education, uh, income inequality, uh, health care. Although the single payer, you know, I. I don't think it'll work, but people want to see health care done more efficiently. There's no question about that, and, and you know, access to everyone. In a general election, of course, if it's Trump, we have a shot, I think. <laughs> but you know, I've been wrong. I, I just, uh, I think if it's, I think Hillary defeats anybody unless it's Kasich, Bush, maybe Rubio. I know there's a fascination with Rubio. I worry about a Rubio, Florida, Kasich ticket, Ohio. I, I worry about it. Those are two big states. Um, Hillary going in, maybe a bit wounded. I think she's still the favorite. But again, as I said, I, I've been wrong. Uh, what has, the, the, the Republican Party seems to be in a state of disarray. Why? What happened? Well, I'm not a Republican expert, but I'll give you my thought. Uh, 
And, and here's what I think is important. If you look at what Lyndon Johnson did in civil rights, in environmental legislation, what Kennedy, all the great pieces of legislation have been passed on a bipartisan basis. Mm -hmm. It's never one party. That was done by Democrats and moderate Republicans. But the moderate Republicans, and I'm not saying establishment Republicans, have, have lost a significant amount of power within the Republican Party. I mean, the emergence of the Tea Party, uh, the emergence of very nativist positions apart from the Tea Party, um, cable news, uh, you fundraise by attacking. Uh, this is both sides, I'm not just saying. So I think that moderate Republican, uh, like Ronald Reagan I, on this immigration debate, I was in Congress and I voted for an immigration bill, simpson Mazzoli Act, which had three million amnesties for immigrants. And Ronald, it was Ronald Reagan's bill. You know, George W. Bush, for, for all his problems and failings, had what I thought was a very sensible immigration bill, which he couldn't get passed in his own party, that had uh, securing the borders, but it had a legalization plan, a path to legalization for the 12 million that are here legally. And, and he couldn't get it done. Now, I think that the bad result of a Donald Trump is, you know, you can laugh at him, you can say, oh, you know, he's outrageous, he's not gonna, but the fact is on immigration, he has now scared the Republican Party into even thinking mm. about a compromise that brings some kind of a path to citizenship or legalization. And I think immigration reform, regrettably, is, is kind of doomed in the short term. Um, in, in the, maybe, maybe in the longer term. And Trump has caused that. This is why I think he's been a very bad and corrosive influence, but he's got appeal, and you know, we're a democracy. You've described yourself as an anchor baby. You were, your parents were living in uh, uh, Mexico City. You were born in Pasadena. Uh, your father wanted you to be born on American soil, and to a large extent, you've achieved the American dream. What is the right immigration policy? If you could be one of those dictators <laughs> that you've negotiated with and, and implement an immigration policy, what would it be? Well, it would be, yes, we have to secure the borders, but if you look at statistics, your own border, New Mexico's border, Arizona, California, there's, the, there's a flow of illegal immigration that is reduced, it's less. I mean, we have a lot of border security, technology, um, it's, it's less. But you have to secure the border. I mean, we have to enforce our laws, but I don't think you build a wall. That's the most idiotic initiative. Uh, you know, I used to say in the campaign until somebody stole the line, you build a 10-foot wall and they'll build 11-foot ladders. <laughs> um, the right immigration policy, uh, Mark, I think is one that has, a, has three prongs. One is securing the border. No question about it. Second, a path to legalization. I don't know who that is. A path to legalization. Um, and, then, and then lastly, you know, I think more economic, see, the, the immigration policy is not just Mexico. Yeah. It's Central America, it's Haiti, it's Cuba. I think there has to be a consistency in that policy. It, one last thing, you know, um, and I, the White House got mad at me they, because I said, you know, these Central American kids and families, they're here, they're leaving because of disease and asylum in Central America, and you want to go conduct raids and throw them back? That's not America. Yeah. Uh, they, they weren't happy with that. I still believe that. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is that Donald Trump taking exception to your immigration? <laughs> He's got an insult or two for you. Uh, Governor, uh, predictions for, uh, for the race. I know this is a very difficult uh, task, but if you were to, to make predictions for who will ultimately garner the nominations of the Democratic and Republican Party, what would they be? Well, I, I've said Hillary Clinton on the 
Democratic side. She'll take a defeat uh, tonight. But then you go into South Carolina, Nevada, Super Tuesday. She starts accumulating delegates. She already has a majority of super delegates. You know, you get the nomination by the number of delegates, not by the number of press you get or, or, or necessarily primary wins in smaller right. states. Right. Um, California is the one state where I think Sanders could do well and maybe slow her down a bit, and that's, that's a fairly early primary. Texas here, I, I remember Hillary Clinton's very strong, although I think there's a strong Sanders movement here, but I don't, I don't think not enough to beat her. So she wins the nomination, and I predict that she'll pick somebody like uh, the Secretary of Urban Affairs to be her running mate, Castro. Hispanic, young, you know, generational change. Um, so I think that happens there. Right. On the, on the, I guess right now the, the pundits, I guess I'm, I'm sometimes one of them. I think most likely uh, it will be an establishment candidate. I think it'll be Rubio. Hmm. Even though he, he was terrible in that last debate, you could tell, and, and Christie was very skillful. And although I have to say that, you know, I was kind of rooting for some of the governors <laughs> uh, as a former governor, um, but, but I, I do think that you will see Rubio, and I think if you see Kasich and Rubio, it, it's gonna be a race. It could go either way. Pardon the really bad pun, but why does the establishment candidate in Rubio trump the insurgents candidate, insurgent candidates in, in Trump and, and uh, Cruz? How does that happen? It happens when the party leadership that controls a lot of the money and the super PACs and the delegates in the big states, you know, they're not a, totally powerless, that they at some point say to Trump, you know, we're abandoning you, but Trump has resources himself. Right, right. So, you know, this is why he's such a dominant factor. You can't push him aside and say, go away. I mean, he hasn't gone away. Yeah. I don't think he will be the nominee, but he may be the kingmaker that says, okay, it's gotta be Rubio, it's gotta be Cruz. I'll throw my support. So he's a, a major player in this election regardless. Right. Uh, we're talking about nominations, and as Don mentioned, you have been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize five different times. I uh, want to thank you for uh, not only being here tonight, but for all you have done to bring peace to this world. Uh, thank you so much, Governor. Thanks for a delightful conversation. Thank you.